So, uh, I'm excited about this passage today. Not any less than other passages that we have in the book of John. But today, we have specifically been praying for uh, folks who have and currently are in the category of you believing in Christ, but carrying perhaps a bunch of shame or a bunch of regret or a bunch of doubt. And the prayer is that God would speak to every single one of us this morning. We prayed that, uh, as Naomi prayed, that the soil of our heart, so to speak, the soil of our soul, would be open to hear what the Lord would speak to us, and that His Word would go deeply into our hearts and reap what His design and desire for it. So if you have a Bible today, please turn all the way to the very last chapter of John, John chapter 21. And we're going to look at half of this chapter as in the restoration of a fallen friend. Now this chapter, as I mentioned last week, is an epilogue, if you are familiar with that term when it comes to reading books, or the post credit scene, right? So after the movie plays and then the credits roll and then sometimes, especially in Marvel movies, they have this little scene afterwards. And so this chapter is like that scene. John could have very easily wrapped up the book with what uh, he concluded with last week, which is our theme verse, right? These things were written so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, we can receive life which is eternal in His name. And by the way, the belief word is just not a one-time I believe. It's an ongoing um, state of being that I believe by believing in his name. This is good news. This is the point of the Gospels to reveal to us this one, Jesus the Christ. And hopefully as you have and as we have walked through this book, these things have become more meaningful for you and have gone deeper in your heart. And hopefully there is a result in esteeming and treasuring and loving and honoring and worshiping Christ more and more. That's my hope and our prayer. And those who didn't know Christ coming into the kingdom. And yet today we see the rest of the story. So you remember Peter, right? We have been tracking with him through this gospel. And he indeed did deny Christ after declaring he would never do so. We see Jesus, of course, in the resurrection. And we see him revealing himself to a variety of people, including the disciples, including Thomas, including Mary Magdalene. And now we get to see the pastoral heart of Christ for those who have failed or messed up or fallen. Isaiah the prophet said this about the Christ. He said, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. And Jesus claimed that for himself as recorded in Matthew chapter 12 verse 22. Aren't you glad about that? Perhaps times in your life that you felt like your faith was very, just a little bit like a flicker and only barely hanging on. Or perhaps you feel like you have been bruised or broken in some way or in some form or perhaps by some decision of someone else or by yourself. Jesus doesn't just say, well, enough of you, Or, you know what, Mm, so sorry, I'm going to pick a better read, right? He cares for the fallen. He cares for those who are carrying guilt and shame because of some type of denial of their belief of the one that they behold and love. You may be carrying that today here, or you may relate to it as you look back on your story of what may happen. 
So this message today, I'm framing it around what Jesus knows and how this knowledge informs his ministry to those who have been wounded because of our fallen nature. Here is the first point, and by the way, if you're new here, we do have notes out there, and if you're online, glad you're with us, you can follow along in the notes that are there in the chat room somewhere. This is the first thing I want us to understand about this passage, that Jesus knows where you are, okay? We're going to break it down, and we'll unpackage these passages. This is John 21, starting with verse 1, reading in the NIV, which is right in front of you in the pew, or whatever you have would be just fine. Afterwards, this is after these appearances, okay, these four appearances, afterwards, sometime afterwards perhaps, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, which were James and John, and two other disciples, they were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. Here is Simon, again, a leader in doing what leaders do often is initiate. And the other says, well, Simon, if you're going out, we're going to go out with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Okay, let's talk about this just for a moment. Now, we don't know exactly when this event happens. We know that the day of his resurrection, he appeared to people, and then it says a week later, he appeared to Thomas. And by the way, they were in, still in Jerusalem at that time. And so this event happened somewhere between a week after he resurrected to 40 days when he ascended to the Father. So somewhere in there, this event happened. Now it had to at least give enough time for the disciples to travel all the way back to Galilee and kind of get back to their old lives, right? Taking care of their physical needs, perhaps taking care of their family. This is the scene. Now, I have to ask the question, how did Jesus know where to find these good fishermen, right? How did he know this? Obviously, they didn't have cell phones or GPSs or tracking devices, right? No telephones, no whatever, and Jesus didn't find them, like, in a house, and there was a city, right? He didn't find them, you know, where, this is a big lake they called a sea, somewhere, it could have been anywhere, right? There were dozens, if not hundreds of boats, right, on this sea, and hundreds of places where they could have gone, and Jesus locates them to make it a little more difficult at night, right? This, by the way, is a miracle. If you ever lost your kid in a crowd, you understand what I'm talking about. You find them again, right? Miracle. This is a, this is a bona fide miracle that he actually knew exactly where on the shore to go and exactly to know when it was dark a hundred yards away where to call them. Jesus knows where you are. Right? And it's beyond where you are just physically. He knows where you are in your thoughts mentally. He knows where you are emotionally. He knows where you are relationally. Jesus has not lost track of you. And there's nothing that you can tell him, by the way, that he doesn't already know. Right? If he can call all the stars out by name, and if he knows the very hair on your head, surely he knows every single thing about you. And by the way, when he asks us a question, he isn't asking it for his knowledge. He's asking it for yours. Right? What do you think about this? Tell me about this. 
This is encouraging to us. He knows where we are. Jesus understands you. He knows how you think. Again, your emotional state and where you are with him. And he loves you. Regardless of where you are, quote, at, unquote. And he draws close to you, calling you by name, even, and I'm going to say especially for those who have stumbled and failed and faltered. He says, come to me. All you who are labor and are heavy laden. Not just talking about carrying physical things. I'm talking about carrying um, spiritual things and emotional things and relational things. These things weigh us down. And we can say, yeah, amen. Right? If you've carried some of those things, you understand the heaviness of your heart. Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you a reprimand. Oh, did I, did I read that wrong? Thank you. I will give you rest, peace, rightness, help you in this stuff and rest for your soul. So, this is the first thing I want you and us to understand. He knows where you are even today. Right? And secondly, he knows how to get your attention. Okay. Let's continue to read this passage starting with verse 4 of John 21. Now, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. Now, the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? <laughs> no. <laughs> Who is this guy on the shore calling to us? Right? Pointing out our unsuccessfulness of our professional fishing friends. <laughs> no. No, they answered. He said, hey, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Let's just stop right there. So Jesus knows the perfect timing to reach out to you and speak into your life and into your situation. His timing is always right. And the waiting for him to speak, the wondering, and sometimes the wandering are all used to develop our understanding, and to shape our soul into His image. God, by the way, never wastes a difficulty, a circumstance, a trial, or a failing. Remember that. He uses it for our good. He set up in this instance and in your own life circumstances perfectly to accomplish and to communicate his goodness and also his good plan. Now think about this. <laughs> what a perfect setup. Jesus spoke to the very fish of the sea, right? I don't know fish language. I don't know what that sounded like. I speak a little whale. Okay, just kidding. Yeah, same. <laughs> like, oh, Lord, help the man, okay? <laughs> Supernaturally set up the circumstances 
So all of the fish stayed away from that boat. He's like, all right, fish, here's the deal. See that boat? Stay away from that boat. And the fish obeyed. And then, just at the right time, at his word, he spoke again to the fish. All right, guys, get close to that boat but just on the right side. (laughs) You you see what, this this is miraculous, by the way. Setting up the circumstances and the fish obeyed. (laughs) And they were caught. As Jesus set up the circumstances in the lives of the disciples, he does the same in our lives. For his purposes, according to our need. Will you continue to trust him as you wait and as you go about your everyday lives? Know that he has not forgotten you. He is working out his plans, even, by the way, in the mundane. Even through our sorrows and separations. Jesus knows how to get our attention even through the circumstances of our lives. Are you paying attention? Do you see? Now, this whole setup contains several layers of meaning. However, the most important and main point is that Jesus reenacted the exact same scenario as when he first called Peter and the sons of Zebedee. If you take this and you turn over to Luke 5 and read this passage, the same thing occurred then. They were out fishing all night. They catch zero. They come back in. Jesus gets into Peter's boat, speaks to the people. They get, Peter gets to sit there and listen. A bird's eye front row seat uh, of this teaching. And then Jesus goes out and says, hey, throw your nets out, boys. And the boys did so. And they caught this large number of fish. Jesus set this scene up just like that scene so that he would get their attention. And John, by the way, right? He was, Jesus was identifying himself, but he was also, and we're going to get to this, calling them again this second time. John was the first to put the pieces together, which leads to our last point and the longest point in this passage. Jesus knows how to restore the fallen. Now, first, of course, he knows where you are. Second, he knows how to get your attention. And when he wants your attention, he will get it. And third, he knows how to restore the fallen. John 21, let's continue to read with verse 7. (laughs) When this event happened, (laughs) then the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, said to Peter, It's the Lord. It's the Lord. Now, as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It's the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off to fish. He jumped into the water. You have a contrast between John, who is the quickest thinker, and Peter, who is the quickest to action. Now, the other disciples followed in the boat, showing the net full of fish. For they, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. This is the first subpoint under this point. Jesus knows how to restore the fallen by renewing their 
calling. So in recreating their first calling, this is what Jesus was communicating by doing this. He was not only re-identifying himself. Boys, it is me. It's the same one who did it. It's the same one who is doing it again. But he also was communicating that he had a calling on their lives. Now get this. Including Peter. Now people, unfortunately, tragically, often think the Lord is done with them if they slip up or fail, or if they've lost, right? They think they've lost it all. Here's the good news. God's gifts and His calling are irrevocable. Do you hear me? There are and have been many people who have believed in Christ And then somewhere along the way, they denied him, even by their words, either by their words or their actions or their activities. Does this mean that you are, or that person is now forever disqualified for using their gifts and ability and fulfilling their calling? Now, I'm not going to say that there isn't consequences for failures, right? I'm not going to say that. It may show itself, your gifting and calling may show itself in a different form, a different faction, fashion at a different time, okay? So hear me in saying that. However, God doesn't gift you and say, mm, I don't think I'm giving that to you. Once he gives it, you have it forever. If God calls you to do something, he doesn't say, "Mm, just kidding. He doesn't take it back. No, I'm not saying that to imply guilt on you. Right? I'm saying that so you can understand that the Lord's calling initially is his continually His continual call now, even if you say, I am now disqualified for even being close to Christ or walking with him or doing anything. That, my friends, is a lie. Why do you say that, Dave? Well, we just saw this passage where you have Peter, the rock, turn into a crumbling stone Carrying shame, carrying guilt, just kind of going back perhaps to his old way of doing, still believing. And yet now here Jesus comes to him. People who are fallen need to hear this. Now, what's also strikingly beautiful about these two accounts as you lay them over uh, one of the other, the first calling and now this recalling or recommissioning, is that at the first time when Jesus connected with Peter, after hearing Jesus speak and after seeing, experiencing this miraculous catch of fish at the word of the Savior, Peter responded the first time, if you remember this, Away from me. I'm a sinner. He wanted to separate himself from Christ in recognition of his glory and perfection and beauty and his own failings or sinfulness. Away from me. For I'm a sinful Now, if you take that and now fast forward to the scene at the very end, per se, of their connection here on earth, Peter doesn't respond that way. Once he realized from John, it's the Lord. Peter did not want to wait even a moment or a minute to connect with him. Instead of trying to put distance from the Lord, Peter had now walked with him and known him and understood his heart. 
and recognized who Jesus was. And he knew that this was indeed the great Redeemer, the gentle healer, the risen Lord. And he immediately shot out of that boat and said, I have to get close to him as soon as possible. May God grant us that urgency to run to him, swim to him, and crawl to him. When he calls to us, and he is calling to you today. His gifting and his calling are irrevocable. And believe me, I have tried to run and hide. God, I don't want to do this anymore. It's too hard. It's too heavy. Can you just leave me alone? Right? And in his right timing... <laughs> Speaks and speaks and speaks and speaks. By the way, all that time that you know, knew Christ before some type of stumbling or falling is not wasted. You still learn things. You still experience things. You still understood things. And you still know things about Christ and His heart. This is... Profound. Swim, turn, run to Christ who calls to you and says, Hey, 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 we ain't done yet. You heard me say in the past, there is zero unemployment in the kingdom of God. You can still breathe, you still have purpose. That's why you're here. Peter needed to hear this because Jesus knows how to restore the fallen by first renewing their calling. He's doing that even yet today. And remember this verse in Hebrews 4.16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Why? Because we're so great? Because we're so good? Because we're so holy? Because we're so righteous? No. So that we may receive mercy. Mercy. Not getting what we deserve. And grace. Getting what we don't deserve. To help us in our time of need. If you feel distant from God, it's not that God has moved from you. He's still there. It's that we have moved away from Him. <laughs> Remember, by the way, in the Garden of Eden, I'm just throwing this in, right? Remember when Adam and Eve, if you remember this from Genesis, right? After they had communion and connection to God. And they knew what to do and not what to do. And they, of course, did what they were not supposed to do, as you would do as well, by the way. Don't think, well, I wouldn't have done that. Ah, stop it. You would have too. <laughs> Self-righteous, whatever. Okay. Remember when that happened? And then God returned to them? And this, um, what's the word? Heartbreaking question was asked. Adam, hey, where are you? There's a distance, and Adam wasn't hiding, and Jesus already prepared a covering for them. By the way, pointing to atonement of animal skins, something had to die in order that we would be forgiven of our sins and covered. Okay, pointing towards that. It says, Adam, where are you? Communicating to Adam that there's distance now between us. And notice that God came to them first. Came to them first as he is coming to us in our failure and in our woundedness and our hurt. Now, Jesus was not done yet with Peter. 
He recreated this scene by a miracle to get their attention, to say, hey, I'm still calling you just like I did then. I'm calling you again. Now the same way, Peter, that has not been lost nor forgotten. And so Peter's there on the shore, and the guys come up in their boat with all of these fish. And as they arrive, they see this scene in verse 9 of John 21. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. This is the second point of this point. Jesus knows how to restore the fallen by repairing their wounds. Now, this charcoal fire in this scene should remind you of another charcoal fire. That's why John highlights this detail. By the way, it's the same word for fire, a charcoal fire. You want to make sure. He's like, hey, hey, pay attention to this. This fire, same fire, was like this fire. This fire on the shore was like the same fire fire of Peter's denial in the court where he gathered himself around the place of Peter's greatest failure in the courtyard outside the place where Jesus was being interrogated. That is where Peter denied even knowing Jesus. Again, after declaring, I will never do that, even if the rest of these schmucks do it, I will not. He did it. That first fire was right after they stayed up all night, right before the rooster would crow, where Peter is trying to warm himself. This fire over here was the same fire Right at dawn before the rooster would crow, when Peter is tired and cold. Jesus, in his, listen to me, mercy, brings us back to our failing so that he can heal our wounds. This is what he was doing. Now, instead of a reprimand, or condemning him at the very place that Peter distanced himself from Jesus. Jesus invited Peter in in close fellowship with him over a meal. Now, I have been hurt and betrayed, and perhaps you have been hurt and betrayed. Is it your natural inclination to invite whoever betrayed you and hurt you to come over and have a meal? (laughs) Yeah, you're like, no. Understand the heart of Christ here. Our great and good shepherd, knowing Peter, knowing all this stuff, says, hey, hey, come here. I know you're cold and you're wet and you're tired. I've got something prepared for you here, Peter. And I know you're probably hungry. I want to minister to your needs, Peter. I'm inviting you to have a relationship with me because one of the most intimate things that could take place is inviting inviting people into your space and sharing a meal together. This is what Jesus was communicating, saying, Peter... I want to be in relationship with you. I want to be close with you. And so as we continue to read in verse 10, Jesus said to them, Hey guys, bring some of the fish you just caught. (laughs) So often Jesus gives to us what he requires of us. He gives us these things. Verse 11 says, Simon Peter 
climb back in the boat, drag the net ashore. Strong man. It's full of large fish. 153, exactly. But even with so many, the net was not torn, unlike the first time. Jesus said to them, guys, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? (laughs) They knew it was the Lord. So Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them. And did, this, did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. What Peter especially needed to hear from Jesus, along with the other disciples who had deserted him, was, not only do I forgive you, but I want to be close to you and fully restore our relationship. I want to be in close fellowship again. What an invitation, do you hear me? Your closeness to Christ isn't dependent upon your goodness, but His. It's important. Not only does Jesus forgive us, He also wants to be close to us because He both Loves us, and check this out, likes us. You say, well, I have to love everybody, but Jesus said nothing about liking them. Right? I hope you like them. <laughs> I really do. Right? And sometimes maybe we think, well, Jesus loves me because he's Jesus and he has to. Yeah, he's Jesus, and he does love you. He made you. <laughs> Imagine this invitation washed over them all. Because, by the way, the other disciples, remember, they ran away as well. They all had some failing, right? And having this invitation, knowing it's the Lord setting up them and in their calling, inviting them into breakfast to heal their wounds, it washed over them like a cleansing stream and a soothing balm. Jesus invites you as well. Now this scene, by the way, and this gesture was so profound and meaningful that the early church adopted the symbol of Christianity, not as the cross, by the way, that came in like 300, 400 years later. Right? They knew that was horrific. You know what they put on their graves? Archaeologists went and covered these things up. It wasn't a cross, but it was a symbol of a fish. You know what it said? I'm in fellowship with Jesus. I am walking with Jesus. I believe in the Savior. He has forgiven me. He has met me. And I'm in fellowship with him. This event stuck and imprinted itself so indelibly in their hearts and souls. They say, I want to declare that to all who View these bones that someday I will live again just like he did. The point of the cross, by the way, is the glory of God in restoring fellowship with us. The point is not just redemption, but relationship. Someday we'll have perfect relationship and seeing and being physically in the same space as Christ. By now we believe by faith and he walks with us by his spirit. This is good news. Jesus restores the fallen by repairing our wounds. Because he loves us. And this was happening. And there was one thing yet to do, in particular, 
with Peter. And his three denials, there was now another three tests, which had to do with his love for Jesus. And so as they were sitting done, after they had finished eating, this is verse 15 of, of John 21, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Hey, Simon, son of John, I'm talking to you. Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, All right, I'm about love, then do this for me, Peter. Feed my lambs. Now again, Jesus said, Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, then take care, Peter, of my sheep. Now, the third time he said this to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus then reinstated this third time, then feed my sheep. Here's this last sub point. Jesus knows how to restore the fallen by reestablishing their purpose. Jesus was giving Peter an opportunity for redemption. Again, as they were, now, gathered around this second fire. Like the fire of his fall, Jesus asked Peter, again, three questions. One, again, for each one of his denials. And all three were asking about not Peter's service initially. The service was an outflowing of the love. You catch that, right? Love first, and out of that love, then serve Christ by doing His will. Don't get that mixed up. Right? All three were asking Peter if he loved them. Because love for Jesus is the only thing that will reestablish our purpose and bring us to full health. Do you hear that? Love of Jesus, from Jesus, and love to Jesus. That is where the life happens. This is called being abiding in the vine, that we are the branch. This connection allows the healing grace and mercy and love of Christ to connect with us. Now, the first question about Peter's love for Jesus was a quantitative question. Do you love me, Peter, more than these? So there has been, by the way, speculation as to what this these mean. Like, Peter, do you love me more than these? And there's three primary um, things this could have meant. And theologians kind of debate these things. Number one, Jesus could have meant, <clears throat> Peter, do you love me more than these fish and these, this equipment this fishing, your old life, and the results of your own life. Peter, do you love me more than these? Right. Now, I think personally that this is highly unlikely because they were sitting around the fire, right? But some say, well, that's what he was referring to, but I don't quite buy that. Right. Now, the second main one is that Jesus was saying... Um, Peter, do you love me more than these guys love me? And I don't quite buy that either. And here's the reasons. One, how is Peter going to know how much they love him? Right? Well, I've been measuring and I found out that my love tank is more full than theirs. So, of course, I love you more than them. Look at the evidence. Peter knew what was in his own heart. Right? He can't say, well, surely I love you more than all these, even though some people point to, well, he said, surely I will not fail you. 
But Jesus wasn't setting up a competition between Peter and his other disciples saying, well, look at Peter, he loves me more than you suckers, right? He wasn't saying that, right? So I think it's unlikely. What I personally think that he was meaning is, Peter, do you love me more than you love these guys? Now, why do I think that? Well, mainly because a teaching that Jesus gave saying that if you don't love me more than your mother and father, if you don't love me even more than your children or grandchildren or anyone else, then you are not, here's the word, worthy of me. Peter, do you love me even more than the love of these people? Peter, do you love me even more than your own life, Peter, which you denied me because you were scared of a little servant girl that you were more concerned about her opinion of you than my opinion of you, Peter? You catching me here? Peter, you have to love me, treasure me. This is the only thing that will keep you firm in me and keep you from failing if you love me and treasure me more than anybody else. That will sustain you. And we have to ask that of ourselves. Do you love Jesus even more than your own reputation, even more than your own life, even more than your mother or father or children or grandchildren or brothers or uncles or aunts or your stinking football team, right? (laughs) This is a significant question that, if I be so bold, the Lord is asking of you today. Do you love me more than me? This will give you the strength to stand up again. If you fear people, you will fall into a trap. But even though you have failed and fallen, you're not finished. Even though the righteous stumble seven, they get up eight. It's not uh, the failing that matters most. It is the standing up that matters. It is time, if you're carrying the weight of failure, to stand up again. (laughs) He's calling to us. He loves us. And Peter, in recognition Right? At first he said, first Jesus responded to him saying, okay, Peter, if you, if you do um, love me, right, more than you love these people, then I have an assignment for you. Feed my sheep. Right? Recognizing who the church is, who you are. You don't belong to me. You don't belong to an organization. You don't belong to an institution. First and foremost, you belong to Christ. You're his sheep. Now, I have a responsibility, right? And we have a responsibility to feed what? The Word of God. That's why, by the way, we we highlight the Word of God in this place. Because my words are not eternal. His is. His words have the Word of life. My opinion does not. Peter, feed my sheep. Give them the word, Peter. This is what I want you to focus on and recognize they're not yours. They're mine. Granted, you're going to have to give an account, Peter, someday. We know this. If you read First and Second Peter, by the way, this is the same Peter who failed, wrote Scripture. And he wrote to other shepherds saying, hey, shepherd the Lord's flock. Do it in these ways. This is what Jesus was saying to him. And then secondly, he says, Simon Peter, do you love me? Right? And he says, not only do I want you to feed my sheep because you love me, take care of them. Don't just get up to a pulpit, 
say the word of God, which is important, walk away and never be in contact with anybody again. There are ministers, by the way, that do that. I'm the holiest. Here, let me get under the light. I'm the holiest. Don't touch me because I'm special. You can ask my wife, I'm a sinner just like y'all. <laughs> you are. <laughs> She's like, hmm. Granted, we have callings, right? We have responsibilities. But Jesus says, hey, hey, Peter, take care of them. Help them when they're wounded. Keep them in green pastures. Help them when they're confused. Help Peter, this is what I'm asking you to do. I'm going to go to the Father. This is what I'm calling to do. Helps us. And then, lastly, he said, hey, Peter was hurt, right? Asked him a third time. Peter knew what was happening here. He's not stupid. And he was hurt. Now, perhaps it was because he was reminded of this and the Lord was healing him just like a doctor when doing surgery has to hurt us to heal us sometimes. Do you hear me? The intent is not to hurt but to heal. In order sometimes to heal, we have to be hurt. Do you understand this? It's for our good. And so he asked him one more time and he hurt and maybe he was thinking, well, doesn't he believe me? So Peter's response is, not only do you know that I love you, but Jesus, you know everything. That question was again for Peter. He recognized not only did Jesus know him, but he knows the future. He knows what's most important. He knows their circumstances. He knows what we should be doing. So Peter loved Jesus more than he loved the other people. And also recognized his authority and his sovereignty. He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And he says again to him, then feed my sheep. Be focused in on this. And if you continue to read in the book of Acts, and you continue to see about Peter, this fallen one now becomes the most bold and his calling, and declared in Acts chapter 2 this great speech about Christ. Peter, I'm going to empower you. It's going to happen. Get ready. Don't carry this shame anymore. Don't hide behind your own failures, but fall in line with me. This is what I'm asking of some of you today. Now, you may be in fellowship in this place with Christ this morning. And I say amen. Right? And I want you then to treasure Christ more because of who he is. He's the great king, but he also the savior surgeon. Right? He's both of these things. He is the judge and he's the redeemer. Worship him for this. No, he hasn't forgotten you. He knows exactly where you're, you're at. No, how he, he knows how to get your attention, pay attention, run, swim, crawl to him. He's here to help you. And then you may be yet in Peter's category today as he was in this passage. You're like, man, I think my calling's done with. It's not done with. I don't know what it's going to look like at this stage of your life, but get up. Get up. Do you love him? You say, well, I'm not so sure. Then ask him for the love that you need because he gives you what he asks of you. Do you hear me? Somebody or some buddies need to hear that today. I'm convinced of it. This is your day. 
to embrace the redemption and the love of God today. This is your day.